<clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about one very special type of uh, deep learning and perhaps the most famous one because it, in fact, uh, is at the basis of the, of the revolution that we're seeing in deep learning across many different domains. And it really sort of brought machine learning and deep learning to the um, conscience of the whole world. So uh, as you know, there's countless amazing outstanding online resources. And uh, today I want to credit uh, number one, uh, 6S191. So this is the uh, totally awesome course that Alexander Amini and Ava Soleimani have developed. And I hope many of you took that over IAP. So for those of you, this will be mostly a review. And also uh, Tess Fernandez, totally awesome Coursera notes that uh, she has posted online and we'll make those available as well. They're really super cool. And of course, David Gifford uh, for uh, many of the previous slides from previous years. So today we're gonna to be talking about convolutional neural networks or CNNs. So next time you hear CNN, you obviously should be thinking about convolutional neural networks. I don't know what else could come to mind, but we'll talk about scene understanding, about the classical machine vision foundations of features and scenes and filters, and then uh, foundational uh, deep learning models that again brought the whole field to the forefront of uh, the popular conscience with incredible uh, performance improvements compared to previous methods and uh, some cool modern CNN architectures and just many, many different applications. So the first thing that I want to start with is that uh, humans like to think that we invented a bunch of stuff, but in fact, nature has kind of beat us to the punch uh, many, many times uh, over. And in fact, uh, convolutional neural networks that actually functions in, that function inside your brains uh, were very much the inspiration for the early architectures of convolutional neural networks. I want to show you this picture again because this is at the core of what deep learning is about. The concept that you start from simple features and you extract higher and higher levels of abstraction before being able to recognize a person from its parts or an animal from its parts or a car from its parts. And this is at the core of all of computer science, the concept of abstraction, the concept that you're building higher constructs on lower constructs over many, many layers. And this is at the core of deep learning, but this is also at the core of human vision. This is how you guys actually recognize the world around you. And the convolutional neural network structures that we have today have their roots very much in the 80s. And they themselves have their roots in the 50s and 60s with key foundational studies of neuroscience and specifically studying the animal visual cortex and of course the human visual cortex. So as early as 1968, and uh, their studies in fact span you know, almost a decade and a half before that, Kubel and uh, Weisel basically studied the brains and the vision properties of cats and monkeys. And they basically recognize some principles that have shaped the field of machine learning and deep learning since then. Number one, the fact that there were receptive fields that as the image is projected onto your retina and the ultimately the neurons that are connected to your visual cortex, you basically have pixels at the lowest layer and there are cells that receive these pixels and that are behind these pixels, but those cells are not fully connected to the whole image. There are specific neurons that are connected to different patches of the image and those patches are overlapping. So the whole concept of having only a limited receptive field for any one neuron that only observes a portion of the image and then the next neuron over will observe a slightly different subset and so on and so forth is at the root of these convolutional filters and the convolutional neural networks that we're talking about today. So the first primitive, the first principle is that the computation is local. The second principle is that they found in the visual cortex of these animals that there were simple cells that would respond to an edge only when they turned it at the right orientation and then that neuron would fire and then they would turn it away and that neuron would not fire anymore and when it was exactly at the right angle that neuron would fire and there were different neurons for different angles 
So that basically taught them that at the root of vision lie simple primitive operations like edge detection. And you could actually construct these edge detectors from simpler building blocks of individual neurons detecting light and dark in different places and thresholding that signal in multiple layers of interpretation. So that was the second principle. And the third principle is that further up in the higher layers of the visual cortex, there were more complex cells that were in fact invariant to whether that edge was detected here or there. So there were higher order neurons that would basically fire equally well if the edge was here or here or here or here, or if an object was here and here and here and here. So they had, you know, every cat has a mouse neuron that will fire when there's a mouse in the image and it will fire regardless of whether the mouse is positioned this way or that way or that way. So there must be something that learns these higher levels of abstraction from these low level primitives. And the concept of positional invariance is again at the basis of the pooling layers that we're gonna be seeing in convolutional neural networks that basically simply look at a larger field of view and simply say, was there a mouse anywhere in there? Did any of my previous neurons detect features that are representative of a mouse? And then after the mouse quote unquote detector neurons fire at anywhere in the image, I then have a pooling layer that basically says, was there a mouse anywhere? So uh, who's, with, who's with me so far uh, so on, on sort of these very basic building blocks of uh, the animal visual cortex? Lovely. Okay, so uh, 58, 35, 600. Zero, zero. Uh, let me see, share results. There we go. And then uh, stop share results. Good. Um, so uh, the second, uh, you know, thing that's emerging from that is that there are layers and these layers of the visual cortex, in fact, go very much in the same progression as the layers of our machine vision primitives. There's pixels at the bottom, then there's edges, namely bands, which respond to very given slant based on contrasts. And then you build shapes from those. And then there's primitives that build up to scenes. And this concept of hierarchical abstractions that basically simple building blocks and local computation coupled with learning and invariance give rise to the ability to recognize complex scenes around us. Continuing on these primitives of the uh, human and animal uh, visual systems and cognitive systems, you have a lot of the same uh, principles that are found in neural networks. So let's review. Of course, at the basis lies a chemical signal that accumulates across the dendritic connections. So the presynaptic axon will basically send chemicals to the postsynaptic dendrite, and these will migrate into the neuronal cell body and then cause the detection of a signal from the previous neuron, okay? So that's the particular instantiation of the adding operation and the weight operation. So the weight is basically how much of the receptor do I have? And then the adding is how much of the neurotransmitter do I receive, okay? So this is the bis basic building blocks of summing and weighing and then the bias, like the you know weight times the input plus the bias is simply how, what is my activation threshold effectively for that neuron? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So then through the dendrites, the cell body, the, the dendrites collect these electrical signals and these chemical signals. The cell body integrates these incoming signals using some sum operation. So it's the sum of the weighted inputs of all of the dendrites. And then it generates an outgoing signal to the axon. And this axon passes these electrical signals to dendrites of hundreds of other neurons, basically saying, yes, I saw a mouse. So you basically have the reception of an edge here and an edge there and an um, eye here and a whisker there that together add up to, wow, I think I see a mouse to letting everybody know that you saw a mouse. So this is what happens at the neuronal level. Every neuron receives multiple signals from many dendrites. And when a threshold is crossed, it fires. So 
if I don't have enough evidence for whatever object I'm programmed to perceive, then I don't say anything. But as soon as I see the evidence, boom, I fire. And that's what we're going to be talking about uh, when we talk about activation functions. So basically, the activation function is going to tell me, do I fire the same exact amount, no matter how weakly the threshold was crossed? Or after I cross the threshold, I start firing. And then the amplitude of that signal is proportional to how much input I received above that threshold. And we're going to be looking at both types of functions. And then the axon sends the outgoing signal to downstream neurons. And then this is the activation function of different, uh, of, of most neurons. So basically, weak stimuli are ignored. We basically have a weak stimulus here, nothing happens. And then stimuli that cross some threshold are still ignored. But if they cross the particular threshold of that neuron, if the depolarization is sufficiently high, then the neuron actually fires. And then this is the temporal view. It fires and then repolarizes and it hyperpolarizes and then it goes back into its resting state. So if you continue firing to it, it's hyperpolarized. So it will not respond for some period of activation. And that's actually a very helpful process inside our brains. So Notice also that there's a nonlinearity within every neuronal level. So basically that nonlinearity means that I don't fire at all for you know, many, many signals above that threshold. But when I cross that threshold, then I fire a lot. So this is not a linear system. And that has a lot of computational advantages, which is that if every neuron was basically doing a linear computation, we could only compute linear functions because a linear transformation of a linear transformation of a linear transformation is still a linear transformation. So there's no abstraction that's possible. You can't learn more complex functions if you don't have non-linearities. And that's built in at the basis of the very building blocks that make our brains uh, function. So then neurons, these are the basic, basic primitives, neurons are not acting in isolation, they're connected into networks. And these networks are basically receiving input from multiple other neurons, summing them up in this particular fashion, and then deciding whether they're going to fire or not. So the neurons are connected into circuits, and that's where the neural network concept comes in. And there are emergent properties of these networks. And that's how learning is possible, by reinforcing these neural connections, by mapping individual neurons to concepts. And these concepts could be simple, as simple as an edge or as simple as a corner or as simple as a whisker or as complex as a mouse or as complex as, I don't know, freedom or anger or justice, okay? So neurons are connected into circuits. There's emergent properties, learning, memory. And then the simple primitives are arranged in simple, repetitive and extremely large and deep networks. And that's something that I want you to appreciate. There are 86 billion neurons inside your brain. Each is connected to tens of thousands of neurons. There's a quadrillion connections, and these are all underestimates. So the human brain is surprisingly large and powerful, given that it only weighs three pounds, and given that it consumes a tiny blip of the energy of any of the modern computers. And given that it evolved tens of thousands of years ago, and it's still sort of fully capable of dealing with the complexities of the world and the environment that has dramatically increased. I want you to pause for a moment and appreciate how unbelievably uh, large and deep the neural networks inside your brain are and how over evolved or over engineered, if you wish, they are for the world that they initially evolved in. So that's at the basis. We basically have you know, these layers and layers of abstraction. Let's dive into how can you make an edge detector, for example? How can I make a line that, you know, a, a line detector that fires for lines of only a particular orientation? The way that I can do that is I can, at the lower level, maybe have an edge detector or have a bunch of neurons that are signaling positively and a bunch of neurons that are connected negatively. And if uh, these are coupled, you will respond to light here and dark there. And if these are reversed, you will respond to dark here and light there, okay? So you can have very primitive computations that allow you to detect just an edge. 
but you could detect the bar by putting together these primitives. Basically, I have an edge here and an edge there. So maybe I have a bar. And if I have the exact opposite configuration, I have a white on black bar or black and white bar. So by coupling these neuronal connections from activating neurons, inhibitory neurons, from you know, difference neurons that sense the difference in potential between other neurons, you can basically have these very basic linear primitives. You can have a circular primitive by basically having multiple neurons surrounded by you know, a negative or a positive stimulus from the opposite direction. And you can couple those together to see how the neurons will fire. And the way that electric signals happen in your brain is that they don't fire you know, in uh, amplitude, they fire in frequency. So when a neuron basically detects a mouse, he won't scream, mouse, it will say mouse, 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 and then you'll stop, okay? So they're, they're sort of frequency coded rather than amplitude coded. So these are the primitives of the visual concepts we can be and which can be encoded in the neural connections. And then from these primitives, your higher layers of your visual cortex are in fact sensing from dots to orientation, some color, some basic shapes, curvature, and more complex features. And that's where the deep part in the deep learning comes in, that these abstraction layers correspond to vi visual cortex layers. And these complex concepts are built from simpler parts. And there's the hierarchy. The other feature that I wanted to appreciate is that hearing, taste, smell, sight, touch, all of these sensory stimuli are using very similar learning architectures. And the you know, dream of Neuralink and you know, sort of being able to control ro a robotic arm for someone who has lost their um, you know, uh, arm um, stems from the ability of our brain to actually reconfigure for additional stimuli. There are people who walk around with uh, belts that sense the gravitational field of the earth. And then they, they receive a very subtle stimulus when they turn one way or another way. Our brain is malleable and eventually will learn how to incorporate that stimulus and not have to think anymore that, oh, it's twitching me to the left, so it must be north that way, but to actually simply know where north is and where south is. So there are examples of uh, individuals who were injured. And then the injured uh, individuals have, that, for example, lost their, uh, you know, I don't know, visual cortex could be reprogrammed to utilize a different part of the brain to sense the corresponding signals. And experiments in animals have basically shown that if you just simply take the visual stimuli from one part of the brain and you know map them to the auditory cortex, it will hear just fine and it will just understand the world just fine. So when bats are flying around, you know, in the dark by sending sort of uh, echolocation signals, they're not thinking of echolocation. They're not thinking of you know the responses. They're seeing, quote unquote, the world the same way that you see the world when you're looking uh, around you. So these uh, circuits are interchangeable and uh, you can actually rewire them in injury or in uh, animal experiments. The other thing I want you to appreciate is how ridiculously enormous your brain is compared to you know, a mouse that shares very much the same biology as, as we do and how that recent expanse was progressive through the primate lineage and culminating with the human lineage. And if you look at the skull of a chimp, you basically see you know, the same exact features except for they're missing this dramatic hardware expansion. So the neocortex is the area above these sort of subcortical regions here. And that expanded dramatically in the mammals compared to our quote unquote reptilian brain. And then the uh, that neocortex expanded dramatically more through the evolutionary pressures of the social networks and the social constructs that um, uh, primates have. And that basically led to our ability for empathy, for understanding emotions, for understanding you know, subtle cues, and for remembering relatives, for recognizing them, and you know, all kinds of additional at higher levels of abstraction that we're now co-opting for pretty much everything. And the other thing I want you to appreciate is that the functions that neural networks can learn are not 
fully general. They can't learn every mathematical function, but they learn an immense range of functions that are very well adapted to the physical world that we inhabit, which happens to be the physical world that our neural networks actually evolved in. So humans have co-opted this circuitry to many, many new applications, but that circuitry evolved much, much earlier. So basically for you know, the last 70,000 years, there haven't been that dramatic innovations in our hardware. Instead, it is the environment that we inhabit that has made us so cognitively uh, capable. And the, uh, the reason why I'm telling you is that all this is because machine learning is still very similar to these architectures that we find in animal brains. And there's enormous room for architecture novelty to go beyond the traditional images that uh, and sort of architecture that we're that we're looking at today. The other thing that I want you to appreciate is that there are visual illusions that can allow us to uh, somehow decode what actually goes on inside uh, our brains. So um, I want you to uh, look at these images and simply count the number of muffins. Okay, I see a lot of smiles already. This is kind of cool. So um, basically the muffin versus chihuahua uh, test sort of makes it just so hard for your brain because you basically are realizing that the same primitives are kind of firing for both. And these visual illusions basically send conflicting signals at different filters or layers inside our brain. I want you to tell me how many um, bagels there are. Second. Uh, cool. So um, now I want you to tell me whether these lines are parallel or not. So obviously the blue lines are curved, right? And these circles are totally wiggly. Uh, but in fact, and in fact, this is a picture of Marilyn right here. Um, but as I zoom into this picture, you will notice that um, this is actually Albert Einstein. But no, it's Marilyn again. Oh, it's Albert Einstein, it's Marilyn. So what's happening here? Basically, the low frequency filters in your brain are basically recognizing the subtle changes in uh, shading, whereas the high frequency features of your brain are recognizing the very precise features. And by encoding two different photos at different frequencies, they're actually clashing inside your brain. And here you can actually see that the uh, circles that I mentioned earlier are perfectly concentric and the lines are perfectly parallel. But again, these visual illusions are teaching us about these conflicting signals inside our brain. And again, this extremely disturbing image is sort of firing all kinds of things inside your brain, whereas, you know, um, that can, you know, simply be interpreted as a, as a person. So these visual illusions basically reveal the primitives and the building blocks and the computations in the architecture that are going inside your brain. And deep learning can exploit such conflicting primitives to create these strong experiences, for example, of seeing a person turn into this monstrous combination of animals or for adversarial confusions of machine learning systems by basically encoding at the low level primitives that will sort of make an ostrich seem like, I don't know, an airplane and vice versa. So um, I want to build on this to look at what are the key ingredients of a convolutional neural networks, of a convolutional neural network. So the first property that we talked about was locality, namely that low level neurons respond to local patches, to local receptive fields, and the computation is extremely constrained in that. In the same way, the deep learning uh, convolutional neural network building blocks are such that the computation of these convolutional filters that we're going to see is again local. It's not a fully connected network. Instead, we're going to be computing on local patches of an image or local patches of a genome. 
The second one is that there are filters, that there are specialized neurons that carry out low level detection operations. And in the same exact way that we saw that in the visual cortex inside your brain, in convolutional neural networks, we're gonna be building these low level filters that carry out the same operation throughout the network, throughout the image or throughout the learning task, whether it's an image or not. The third feature we saw was the concept of layers and abstractions. There were layers of neurons that were learning increasingly abstract concepts. The way that we're gonna be mapping this into CNNs is we're gonna have layers of hidden units where abstract concepts are gonna be learned from simpler parts, from building blocks. The fourth concept that we saw was an activation threshold. The fact that neurons fire after some activation threshold is crossed and that introduces a non-linearity in the system, which basically makes learning possible in the first place. And in the same way, we're gonna be using activation functions. So we saw ReLU, for example, this rectified linear unit, we saw softmax, we saw tangent uh, and, and other functions that basically introduce these nonlinearities and thereby expand the universe of possible functions that we can capture and encode and learn both inside our brains and inside our convolution neural networks. The fifth concept that we saw is the concept of pooling, namely that there were some higher level neurons that were invariant to the exact position where the mouse was present and they were taking either the sum or the maximum of the previous layer. And in the same way for convolutional neural network, we're gonna be building not just these convolutional layers that basically extract higher level information from lower level primitives, but we're also gonna add these pooling layers, which are gonna be simply saying, did I see a mouse anywhere in this image or did I see a whisker anywhere in that patch? And that will give us the positional invariance, which is very important, but it also allows us to have a reduced number of parameters because we're going to take these very, very high pixel count images and sort of, you know, uh, extract away a small number of yes, no questions about whether particular features appeared in those images or not. And that also allows us to speed up the computation because we don't have to compute for every pixel in the image. We just need to compute for the local patches. The other aspect that we saw is that they're multimodal, that basically there were neurons that were extracting. So in the visual illusions, we saw how some neurons were basically firing for Marilyn and other neurons were firing for um, Einstein. And um, the, the, the reason for that is that we have multiple interpretations of the same image co-inhabiting every single uh, stretch of image in your brain. Some are detecting edges this way. Some are, are detecting edges that way. Some are detecting circles. Some are detecting whiskers and so on and so forth. So you basically have multiple interpretations of the same 2D image co-inhabiting, creating a volume, creating a depth of multiple filters being applied at the same uh, time. And these multiple, and, and in the convolution neural network, and we're gonna do the same thing. Instead of having specialized neurons that compute particular operations, we're now gonna have multiple filters that are gonna be applied simultaneously. Every one of those capturing a different aspect of the original image. Some of them might be recognizing the low level shading, others, the high resolution uh, pixels and uh, edges and so on and so forth. We talked about saturation, the fact that some neurons get tired after activation and the signal quiets down. We saw how after the depolarization, there's a hyperpolarization that basically makes that neuron unable to fire after a while. There are multiple such cases of a repeated stimulus. For example, if you're, and I'm going to ruin the rest of the lecture for you guys, listen closely. Your laptop is having a fan sound. It's like, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Now you're going to hear for the rest of the lecture until you forget about it again. So your neurons are able to sort of quiet down signals that are repetitive and that are not informative. And in the same way within neural networks, we're going to be looking at ways of limiting the weight of individual hidden units. We're going to look at various ways of doing regularization of, uh, you know, if, if a neuron has been firing for a while, 
reducing the amount with which it fires so that I can pay attention to the salient features of the environment. And we're going to look at dropout learning, uh, as we talked about actually a couple of lectures ago, of being able to just randomly throw away individual uh, input nodes to a particular neuron at multiple rounds of learning so that they don't over rely on any one particular one and they don't overfit. So again, this is a feature that's, that's also found inside the human brain. We also have uh, in the human brain reinforcement. Basically, there are useful connections that are strengthened over time. So if you're, I don't know, trying to you know, throw the basketball in and you're doing it the first time, the second time or the third time, or if you're trying to ride a bicycle and you know, you're leaning to the left or you're leaning to the right, you know, your brain is actually learning how to do a new motor task and it strengthens the connections that are helpful for that task and limits the other connections. And these connections get built up with epigenetic memory, with transcriptional memory, with you know, additional sort of connectivity. There are microglia that come inside your brain and sort of prune out neuronal connections that are not heavily utilized and strengthen those connections uh, over time that do get utilized. So this is basically the, the, the primitives that we see in backpropagation, where we adjust the weights of these neurons across the entire hierarchy based on the learning task at hand. So you're trying to learn uh, how to ride a bicycle and you're adjusting the weights of your motor and cognitive and balance uh, sensory and actuatory uh, signals to basically uh, correct for things that you are naturally learning how to do through more or less the same uh, or at least very similar processes. And there are also feed forward edges, for example, inside our brain. There are some neurons that have very long connections from lower levels all the way to the higher levels. And if you look at ResNets that we're gonna talk about today, these residual networks are in fact feeding these lower level signals, uh, which again has the computational advantage of avoiding vanishingly small gradients uh, across these many, many different layers and allow you to learn deeper arch architectures. So again, the last three are perhaps a little more stretched, but what I want you to do is sort of appreciate that a lot of what makes learning possible inside the human brain is in fact using the same primitives and the same engineering constructs that we have put into our convolutional neural networks. And that the reason why I'm flagging all of those is because I don't want you to just be content with the current architectures, I want you to think beyond that. I want you to think about sort of individual primitives that you feel are helpful for navigating the real world and how those primitives might actually be encoded into new computational architectures that have not yet been invented. So uh, the, I, I think I'm gonna stop there and see uh, who's uh, with me so far. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> well, this is very, very nice. So um, we have 59, 32, 9, 0, 0. And then the last thing that I want to ask you is uh, who feels that they've learned something. Very, very nice. Cool. So uh, we have 51, 37, 633, which is great. Um, okay, and then last question about the pace. How's the pace so far? <clears throat> and uh, TAs, are there any questions from the chat that you um, would like to bring up for the whole class? Again, I love that there are 23 messages right now that, I mean, you know, this is just such a cool experience of being able to ask questions real time and answer them. All right, so. Um, yeah, we, we do have one okay, um, unanswered question in the chat, which is about a fully co connected network. So how do you think about applications that do or don't need locality? Okay, I love that. So it's a fantastic question. I'm gonna come back to it and in fact, on the next slide. <laughs> so, so it's, it's, it's a great question. And I think that this slide will actually answer it. So 
the way that I think, and that I think you can think of these deep neural networks is really two parts. So there's a first part, which I like to think as simply representation learning. And then there's another part, which is all about classification. And you do see both inside our brains. So we do have fully connected layers and we have convolutional layers. And the, 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 the dichotomy that I want you to sort of recognize between the two is that the traditional neural networks, the classical neural network from the 60s, were fully connected uh, networks. And the challenge there is that you have every single pixel of the image yelling at the same neuron. And it's impossible from all of these pixels together to say, oh yeah, there's a mouse there. But by first having these hierarchical layers of learning combinations of pixels into feature extraction across multiple features. So every single stack here is a 2D filter that gets computed, but a different 2D filter. And then a pooling layer that basically says, did I find anything in that whole patch? And then from these detections, these additional convolutional layers and additional pooling, et cetera, followed by fully connected layers. So what's happening here? What's happening is that we're learning a complex nonlinear function by having these ReLU and other activation nonlinearities, activation function nonlinearities here. But we're doing that not on the raw pixels, but we're doing that on a series of representations that we've learned. So in deep learning, however, what's really, really cool here is that the two tasks are coupled. The classification task is back propagating all the way down. And it's in fact shaping, it's driving the feature extraction tasks of representation learning. And that is an extremely powerful and general paradigm. So I want you to sort of realize that, that, that we haven't even begun to explore the diversity of uh, architectural uh, designs. And the field is at its infancy and you, you can be creative, that, that there's new application domains that are well beyond images. Again, images and sort of more or less the sensory natural world that's around us have driven a lot of the field of machine learning, but our brain is kind of old fashioned. <laughs> I mean, we basically have, you know, so many more complex scenarios where we want our machines to do tasks that humans might actually not be very well suited for. And you should think about structures that current architectures don't, do not even begin to capture or to exploit. And in fact, the reason why I'm excited about this course, and I hope that you guys are excited about this application domain is that genomics and biology and neuroscience and imaging and you know all of these uh, electronic health records and these multidimensional multimodal uh, domains and data sets can help perhaps drive the development of new architectures. And those new architectures might in fact be broadly applicable to data science, you know, in finance, in, you know, economics, in geology, in astronomy, and et cetera, where we have new types of data that are not yet uh, available uh, to, to our sort of cognitive uh, tasks that, that we have evolved for which are in fact much more simple in a way than the extremely multidimensional data sets that we're looking at now. Okay, so are there other questions in the chat? If not, um, <clears throat> let's uh, now use these primitives that we talked about to basically learn complex scenes. And I want you to somehow reverse engineer your brain and see this image that I showed you a couple of lectures ago, but now through the lens of how am I actually recognizing this? Because your brain is doing all of this computation that we talked about. It's doing all of these convolutional filters, these edge detectors, these object detectors, these abstractions, and it's showing you an a highly interpreted and highly interpreted view of the world rather than ever thinking about the original pixels. But I want you to somehow decouple that and start thinking about sort of what are all of these operations that are happening instantaneously inside your brain every time you, you see such a scene and interpret it. So what we're going to be looking at is how can we use convolutional neural networks to translate pixels to concepts. 
So what you see is, of course, Abraham Lincoln, and the computer just sees a bunch of numbers. They're simply pixel intensity values, and pixel is simply picture element. So an image is just a matrix of numbers, but you can answer this question by abstracting away concepts of an eye and a beard and, and a nose and you know ears and hair, etc. This iconic image of Lincoln can be seen with just information that, that, that appears meaningless otherwise. And there's nothing in these sets of, sets of numbers that, that has that meaning. So where does this meaning come from? It's now use all of these building blocks, all of these tools and see how we can compute them computationally in the concept of, in the context of convolutional neural networks, okay? So let's start with the first word, convolutional neural networks. So what are these convolutions that we've been talking about? These are again, in exploiting the spatial structure. They're carrying out local computation and very importantly, they're sharing parameters across the entire image. The, the, the fact that I can have the same filter, the same computation applied to every single patch of the image means that I don't have to learn a billion parameters. I just need to learn 25 parameters in a five by five pixel rather than you know, a billion parameters across how these five by five uh, block is applied to every pixel of the image. So that's the first fundamental concept of convolutional neural networks. The key idea is that we're reusing the parameters a convolution operation shares parameters. And here's one example where I'm computing the same exact operation in every single patch of my image. So here's an example of a three by three convolution on a five by five image. So I'm applying the same exact filter, the same exact computation in every single part of that image, okay? So what exactly is that computation? For example, my filter might be 101010101. So it's effectively recognizing X's. Okay, so every time there's an X, it fires. So here it basically fires with you know intensity four in the first one because there are four pixels in common between my filter and the first batch of the image. So it gives me a four. On the second one, there are three common ones, so it gives me a three. On the third one, there are four common ones and they give me a four and so on and so forth, okay? So that's convolution. Convolution is simply taking a filter or a kernel and it's applying it to every single patch of the image. And it's computing a feature map that basically tells me how much was that feature present in every single patch of the image. Okay, so let's see who's with me so far. Who's with me on the concept of a convolutional filter? There's many, many layers of interpretation that we're gonna see of that convolutional filter, but at the basis, it's just a matrix operation. It's just computing a pairwise, you know, pixel by pixel comparison of a filter versus a patch of an image. Awesome. So uh, 69, 22, 800. It's great. Okay, so that's the convolutional filter. So we can then apply that convolutional filter to every single part of the image. And that's effectively doing feature extraction. It's basically telling me, did I see an X here? Did I see an X here? Did I see an X here? And over here, we have a feature map that basically tells us where did that feature map onto all of the patches of the image. So we're applying a set of weights, a filter to extract local features. And the feature is I saw an edge or I saw a whisker or I saw a leg at different layers of abstraction. And we're gonna be using multiple filters to extract multiple features. So one is gonna be looking for edges this way, one's gonna be looking for edges that way and so on and so forth. And again, key principle, we spatially share the parameters of each filter. We basically have a set of parameters at the very end here, which is the fully connected layer. And we have a set of parameters for every filter. So this particular you know, filter, this might be the edge detector, and this might have 
a three by three grid of parameters. So nine parameters for, you know, right pointing edge detector. Another nine parameters for left pointing edge detector. Another uh, nine parameters for, you know, circle detector. Okay. So these parameters are shared. I can, it, basically every feature has a parameter and I apply that feature extraction on the entire uh, image at a time. Okay. So um, for every neuron in a hidden layer, you take the input from the patch, you compute a weighted sum, and then you apply the bias. So why a bias? Because not everything is a linear function. Basically, you know, every neuron has some level of, you know, activation at which it fires. And that's the bias in absence of any data. In absence of any data, I always get the B. But in presence of data, I basically get some linear function of the input weighted by the corresponding weights. Okay. So we're applying a window of weights, we're computing a linear combination, and we're activating with a nonlinear function. Okay. So at the basis, every convolutional filter operation is exactly this. So that's the first part that computing is super trivial. It's just an operation that I'm doing over and over again. The second part is that these filters, these quote unquote kernels, these convolutional filters are basically extracting features from the image. And we're basically learning representations. So the, the convolution operation is basically saying, ooh, I'm gonna detect a vertical edge so here's a three by three filter that detects a vertical edge. And then in an image like this, that filter fires the strongest in the middle of the image. Okay, so the, if, if I, you know, if you look at Photoshop, for example, you can select different filters inside Photoshop and you can select a sharpen uh, or an edge detect or a strong edge detect. And basically these features have been hard coded for decades inside Adobe Photoshop. And people have basically selected hard coded features that have been used you know, over and over again. So if you have an input image, even the simplest filter of one minus one will basically result in an output that will immediately detect the edges of your image. And there's many, many such filters or kernels. Why do we call them kernels? Because they transform uh, the original space into a projected space. And we saw in the very first lecture when we talked about support vector machines, how powerful kernels can be, because you can basically create a transformation, a mapping of your original space into a transformed space. So for example, edge detection is one of the simplest ones. Sharpen is another one. Blurring is another one. Gaussian blurring is another one. And all of these, you can just simply in your head, see what they're doing. So this one is, is detecting an edge in one dimension. Here's detecting an edge in you know, the center versus the periphery. Here, the center versus the entire periphery and so on and so forth. And notice that they're all trying to have a zero one output for a zero one input. So they're not, you know, they're dividing by nine, they're normalizing so that they're not sort of over, uh, over sensitive. So that's the second concept that in fact, we are learning features. We're learning representations of the original data. The third part is that we can actually learn these representations. We don't have to rely on 30 year old filters. We can just learn them de novo for the task at hand. So as I was mentioning earlier, your uh, task is driving the filters that you learn. If some filters are not helpful for detecting mice, then the cat is not gonna evolve these filters. So in the same way that different species have evolved convolutional filters hard-coded from birth inside their neurons and sometimes learned after birth through exposure to particular environments, the same filters can be reused for the most helpful tasks for that species. 
And if some tasks are very, very helpful for a particular species, then evolutionarily, they're going to be eventually hard coded inside the neural networks that they're born with, even without any learning. Uh, the, however, there are some filters that are generally helpful. For example, um, edge detection is helpful everywhere. Maybe even face detection is helpful everywhere. So we can think, and, th and that gets you to transfer learning and sort of, you know, the more advanced architectures, we can basically say, well, maybe I don't want to relearn my entire representation of the world with every new task. Maybe I want to apply a set of convolutional filters to a corpus of images that are relevant for edge detection, boat detection, object detection, animal detection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then after I've used these for enormous corpi or corpuses of data, I can then learn uh, only the last layers for the particular feature at hand. So for example, if I have um, medical images from you know, thousands of patients where I'm looking at their lungs, for example, I might learn convolutional filters that are very relevant to lung biology from an enormous corpus and then apply it to COVID patients, for example, um, that have only emerged recently as opposed to having decades of training data that I can, that I can work with. So I can basically pre-learn here intermediate levels of representations and even high levels of representation and then retrain the uh, subsequent uh, parts. All right, so um, now, the, as I was mentioning earlier, the, the beauty and the power of convolutional neural networks is that you learn these filters, you learn the convolutional filters, you extract common features from your image. So to identify a person, you can look for, you know, common filters can be helpful, such as noses, eyes, and mouths. But these are completely useless if you are trying to recognize different types of cars, where the features that matter here are wheels and license plates and headlights, and they're completely useless if you have a database of architectural uh, buildings that you're trying to, I don't know, estimate the price of, uh, where the relevant features here are doors and windows and steps. So there's very different features that are helpful in every new image category. So the key idea of convolutional neural networks is that we're going to be learning learning, not hard coding, a hierarchy of features directly from the data rather than hand engineering them. So instead of handcrafting filters in Adobe Photoshop, we can basically learn the features de novo in our data set. And these uh, features are learned directly for the task at hand. So if your task at hand is distinguishing different humans at an airport, then the low level features are gonna be very different than if your task was architectural or if your task was cars. And then the mid-level features you can see are already starting to recognize eyes and ears and, and noses and so on and so forth. And then the high level features are starting to recognize the facial structure. So these are tuned to the particular classification task at hand, which is then feeding back through the entire network. So through the different layers, the, the different convolutional layers, you're basically extracting these features. So I forgot to mention, why do we mention, why, why do we call them convolutional in the first place? Because this is actually a convolution operation because you're sort of convolving basically means you are twisting together two things. So revolve, evolve, convolve, etc., are all the same root. It basically means, you know, twisting one into the other, and then deconvolution is taking them apart. So convolution means you're, you know, warping this through that filter, okay? So that's the, you know, the next task, basically. So learning these convolutional filters. The next feature that we talked about in the brain is detection. So was there an edge? Was there a mouse? Did I see whiskers and so on and so forth? 
And that's where the nonlinearities come in. Because if you don't have these nonlinearities, everything is yelling at the same time. You're basically getting the filter for whiskers, basically giving me low level noise and the filter for tails giving me low level noise again, constantly through the world. And I can't concentrate on anything. Whereas if instead I introduce these nonlinearities, I have silence until I've actually seen a tail. And then I'm like, oh, there's a tail. So that's where the nonlinearities come in. And you can, you can think of them as detection, as saying something is there or not. Yeah, I think it's frozen. Um, if it's just, it's not just you. <laughs> I, uh, okay. Are you guys back? Yes. Are we back? Yeah, we're back. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me know. Um, okay, so these are the nonlinearities that we talked about, and we talked about several different types of nonlinearities and. The concept that I wanted to extract from here is that it's about detection. It's about sort of observing that something is there. The next concept we talked about was the pooling layers. And the, that gives us positional invariance. And what pooling allows you to do is basically find the maximum value in some kind of section. And it reduces the size of the representation. It speeds up the computation. And it makes some of the detected features more robust. And that's basically knowing that I detected something anywhere within that patch of image is all I need to know. And then I can take an action that's based on having detected some something anywhere. So for example, this is max pool with two by two filters and stride two. So that basically means that I'm computing on a two by two grid and I'm taking the maximum of that grid. And then I'm not computing this intermediate one. I'm sort of jumping by two each time. Okay. And you can play with these parameters. You can adjust how big is your filter, how big is your stride, and uh, whether you want to take the maximum or the average. And that has many useful features like dimensionality reduction, spatial invariance, and so on and so forth. So uh, again, it gives up on the extremely precise spatial location. It doesn't care exactly what pixel gave rise to that feature, but it is a feature, not a bug. It's actually helpful that you are positionally invariant. And once more, this is reminiscent of what actually goes on inside our brain. And then the last uh, concept is classification. Basically, that's where we get to the fully connected layer, where we're basically learning these you know, much more complex functions that now use, utilize information from the entire scene. So if I'm trying to respond to a particular scene in the environment, I want to know that, you know, oh, there was a tree and a bird and, a, you know, a rabbit and so on and so forth. And from that, I can sort of take an appropriate action. And that's basically the fully connected layer where every neuron in the hidden layer is connected to all of the neurons in the input layer. There's no more spatial information. We've now done all of the feature extraction and now it's just about the classification. And this takes many, many, many parameters. So, um, and then these fully connected layers are allowing you to capture combinations of the features that you've now extracted from your network. So after all of these layers of convolution, I now have features here, which I'm now combining and utilizing and multiplying. And you know that allows me to ultimately decide if something's a person or a cat or a dog and so on and so forth, okay? All right, there's some additional, uh, you know, uh, aspects to capture. Uh, one of them is edge cases. <laughs> These are literally edge cases. Uh, so uh, how do you deal with the fact that when I compute my convolution, I can't quite compute it on the first pixel um, because, you know, my images will end up shrinking. So if I take a six by six image, uh, or a three by three filter, all of the edges will basically not get uh, treated well. And the solution is basically to pad the images with a border of zeros before convolving. 
and there's many different uh, padding options. So you could simply not pad, or you could pad according to your filter size so that the output size is exactly the same as your input size. So you're maintaining that invariance. So uh, again, you can zero pad the input. So the output is the same, or you could choose only valid convolutions and only have an output when the entire kernel is contained in the input. But the problem with that is that it shrinks the output or you could use your full convolution by zero padding the input so that the output is produced whenever an output value contains at least one input parameter. And this actually expands the output. So again, you have many different options here. Um, there's other practical issues, for example, the stride. So how much do you jump each time? So you can have a stride of two or a stride of three or a stride of one. And um, you can also have dilated convolution. So you could compute a three by three patch, but instead of computing the three by three patch only here, you could compute the three by three patch by expanding the distance between individual pixels that you're looking at. And again, don't think of this as just at the level of pixels. You can think of it as also at the level of these higher order features that you're learning each time. So if your input is here, you can have a hidden layer with dilation one, a hidden layer with dilation two, a hidden layer with dilation four, and so on and so forth. So another super important uh, concept is that in the real world, features dramatically vary from one image to the other. So for example, if I show you these three images, you clearly recognize a person in every one of them. And in fact, if you look closely, you recognize that it is exactly the same statue seen from three different angles. If you look at these penguins here, you recognize that it's the same penguins regardless of the luminosity. You recognize a cat, whether it's partly occluded or whether it's con contorted or whether it's in a leopard couch. And you recognize chairs, no matter of how crazy the chairs are. And you recognize people, no matter how different they are from each other. So how can we achieve this for machine learning? Basically, all of these filters and networks that we've talked about uh, you know, are not quite meant for this. And you know, the question is, if my X looks exactly like this, yes, my filter will recognize it. But what if my X looks like that? How can I learn a filter that will recognize even deformed Xs? So one way would be feature engineering, figuring out you know, how to make my filters invariant to transformation. But there's a much simpler way, which is instead of learning how to be invariant to transformation, Let's simply transform the images in the first place. So we can basically augment the data by mirroring my image of a cat, by randomly cropping my image of a cat, by randomly rotating and shearing and warping, and by shifting the colors of a cat. So I'm still learning the concept of a cat, but instead of having just one image of a cat, I now have thousands of perturbations of that one image of the cat which effectively accomplishes the same goal. Instead of learning for my features to become invariant, I'm throwing in the variance, but directly onto the training images. And therefore the functions that I'm gonna be learning are gonna be invariant to that. So that you know, I can recognize objects no matter where they are in the scene, no matter what orientation and rotation. So basically this bus and that bus and that bus are changing in size, changing in orientation, in shape, et cetera but I can still recognize them and uh, classify them as, as such. So the answer is that we're gonna learn a ton of features, millions of features from the bottom up, and we're gonna learn the convolutional filters and we're gonna learn them by transforming the images to, be, to achieve this uh, invariance, okay? So uh, let's see who's with me so far on how we can achieve uh, invariance to all of these transformations by uh, transforming the images that we feed in the first place. So kind of like learning how to throw a basketball, you can you know, sort of throw a bunch of times and you're effectively feeding a population of uh, parameters to your brain uh, for that. All right, so we have 66, 34, 0, 0, 0. All righty, so we've covered an immense amount of ground. And we can now see how are we putting all of this together, okay? 
So now let's review the very first slide that we had before diving into all of these different components. We talked about locality through these convolutional filters. We talked about the concept of filters and features that basically carry out the same operation about abstraction, about these progressively higher order concepts. We talked about thresholding through these activation functions. We talked about pooling and this maximum and average pooling and the positional invariance, the reduction parameters and the speeding up of the computation. We talked about multimodality, the fact that I can compute many, many filters, giving me a volume rather than just a matrix at every uh, layer of my network. We talked about saturation and reinforcement and feed forward edges and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's put it out, put it all together now. So here's your typical deep convolution neural network. So we basically have a 39 by 39 image as the input, and it's an RGB image, red, green, blue. So we're gonna have a volume of 39 by 39 pixels times three different input uh, channels. Okay, everybody with me? After that, we're now computing 20 different filters on that image with a stride of two. So that basically means that I'm gonna have a depth of 10 because I'm computing on this 37 by 37 or 39 by 39 image um, at every pixel, and let's not worry about the edges yet, at every pixel, I'm computing 20 filters but I'm not computing them like every pixel, I'm computing them every second pixel. So I'm basically gonna have a volume of 10 after that. And because my uh, filter has length five, then, oops, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead here. So uh, I'm computing three features on my 10 filters. Sorry, uh, I'm computing 10 filters uh, and that basically creates a volume of 10 and then that, you know, that's how we go from here to there. And the, I think the important thing to take out is that based on the number of filters that I'm computing, if I'm computing 20 filters here, I'm gonna end up with a volume of 20. If I'm computing 40 filters here, I'm gonna end up with a volume of 40 and so on and so forth, okay? So I'm computing basically multiple features at every time, changing the shape of that volume at every layer of my network and in the end, I'm flattening out my, my network. So if I have a seven by seven by 40 uh, different uh, layers. So here, I basically have 40 concepts that I've computed on each seven by seven patch of the image, okay? And my 40 concepts might be cat, mouse, angry, black, you know, scary, et cetera, okay? So these are the 40 concepts that I've learned. And those 40 concepts are in a seven by seven patch. And now I'm throwing all of these 40 concepts for every single patch of my image. And I, I have this 1,960 flat feature space, which I then bring to my, you know, final uh, fully connected network, for example. So this is a deep convolutional neural network. This is another example where instead of just having these convolutional layers over and over again, I now have a convolutional layer and then a pooling layer and another convolutional layer and another pooling layer and then multiple layers of this fully connected uh, architecture, okay? So based on the number of filters that I'm computing, I'm then pooling and so on and so forth. Again, we can detect multiple features at a time so if I have say an RGB channel here and I can compute multiple features there, I, I, I then can have two filters computed, one for detecting whiskers and one for detecting tails. Now I know in my feature map, where did I see a, a, a whisker and where did I see a tail, okay? And so on and so forth. So if you jump into code, this is how you actually implement those in you know, uh, TensorFlow. So you can basically say import TensorFlow as CF, and then I'm gonna basically use the Keras uh, engine for deep learning. And then I'm gonna create a 2D convolutional layer with you know, uh, different filter sizes, with this particular activation function, 
with different uh, pooling and different stride size and so on and so forth. And then I'm going to be flattening. So basically, this is my first convolutional layer. Then I'm going to add another convolutional layer and a pooling layer, another convolutional layer and a pooling layer. And then I'm going to be flattening this. And then I'm going to create these fully connected layers with different activation functions. And this basically gives me an architecture with which I'm going to be able to classify objects in the real world. OK? So let's see who feels that they've learned something today. Hmm. Great. So uh, 67, 21, 363. Three. Uh, any questions from the TAs that have not been answered yet? All right, so now let's look at different architectures. For example, this is one of the first ones by uh, Jan Lecun. This is uh, Le Net 5, and it's for document recognition. And it basically helped establish how we think of convolutional neural networks today with a series of convolutional filters and subsampling and uh, last step of fully connected uh, layers and an output, okay? So, this was able to recognize characters in, you know, checks or uh, documents uh, that were handwritten. And, you know, it used more or less the architectures that we just talked about. And it had only 60,000 parameters. But as we went deeper into the network, the, you know, number of convolutional filters uh, you know, changed. So, uh, and again, all of this is done through backpropagation. So basically you're taking the derivative of your error function relative to your uh, input, but also, sorry, relative to your weights of your fully connected layer, but also relative to each of the filter parameters. So if I have a three by three filter, I can ask how is changing that pixel or sort of that, that position of that filter as it's computed through the entire matrix, how is that improving my overall performance? So then you're going to be taking the uh, partial derivatives of your error function compared to all of your uh, individual parameters. And then, you know, you basically do your convolution, you have your nonlinearities, you have your pooling, and your fully connected layers uh, at the end. And again, for, you know, detecting cars, you can have convolutional layers, uh, rectify linear unit activation functions, convolution detection, pooling, convolutions are basically applying the feature extraction, detection, feature extraction, detection, and then you know uh, position invariance and so on and so forth. And in the end, your fully connected layer will basically give you the classification. And again, as we talked about, if I compute five different maps, I basically have a depth of five, and these are just different layers of your, you know, uh, height by width uh, operation. All right, so all of this is the foundational building blocks of convolutional neural networks, and hopefully, you know, you, you can sort of see both why they're awesome and why they're actually quite natural and why they accomplish tasks in a very natural way. So. Training convolutional neural networks is very much an art. And that's something that an enormous amount of research has gone into. So with classical machine learning, you have, you know, on the order of hundreds, tens of thousands of samples. And you can train with 60% of your data. You can use, you know, your development or your validation set for another 20%. And then you leave out another test set of 20% of your data. And you want to make sure that they're all coming from the same place, from the same distribution that in fact your training set is not just a bunch of you know super pro cap pictures from the uh, internet and your test set is you know the, your amateur blurry cat picture from your app so you know you want to make sure that your training set and your test set and your dev set are in fact from the same distribution but the challenge with deep learning is that you have mo many more parameters you're kind of learning these at many many different layers so you need a lot more training data. So you don't have the luxury of sacrificing 40% of your data for dev and test. Instead, you use 98% of your data for training, and then you have millions and millions of samples. So now you have enough to sort of set aside your dev and your test. Okay. So 
normalization matters in training. So if your data is asymmetric across the different dimensions, then you want to rescale it so that the variance across each of the dimensions is uh, the same. And of course, you want to use the same normalization for both your, both your test and your dev and your training set. The other challenge that we talked about earlier is that if your data is unnormalized, you can have shooting of your gradient in all kinds of directions. But if you normalize your data, you can in fact use a higher uh, rate of learning. We talked about the rate of learning, the gradient descent slide last time. Um, there's a huge challenge with vanishing or exploding gradients. When you have deep neural networks with many, many layers, you can have very, very small deviations become extremely large, or you can have these weights at the very beginning have almost no noticeable effect all the way down. So basically, after each of these layers, you can basically have you know, this completely vanishing gradient for small numbers or these exploding gradients for large numbers. And in both cases, gradient descent will basically take a very long time. And one solution is to basically choose your initial values very carefully by you know, adapting the variance to uh, the number of inputs. Another uh, challenge associated with learning is how to choose the batch size. So you could basically say, I'm gonna train on my entire data set at every single iteration. And if, of course, that's extremely costly. Instead, what you could do is choose mini batches and use gradient descent on each mini batch at a time, rotating between the mini batches, making sure that you're not just training on a small part of the data, but also making sure that you're not sort of, you don't have to traverse the entire uh, uh, data set each time. So if you uh, use batch size one, that's basically stochastic gradient descent, which is choosing one random element each time and then adjusting the gradient based on how it performs on that element. If you choose size M, then it's basically mini batches and the, uh, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs between small and large uh, mini batches. Um, there's all kinds of really cool uh, technologies for training. So RMS prop, the root main squared uh, approach is you know, allowing for either slower or faster learning based on uh, normalization between uh, these parameters. And then uh, you can also vary your learning rate by uh, you know, different functions depending on the number of epochs to basically start out with larger learning and then you know, using um, something known as simulated annealing, which is basically uh, tuning the learning rate to basically decrease with the number of epochs. The hyperparameters of your uh, deep convolutional neural network are effectively the number of hidden units, the mini batch size, the number of layers, the learning rate, the decay rate of the learning rate, et cetera. And then these hyperparameters, which are your parameters are the weights and the biases. The hyperparameters are basically the architecture and then the training parameters. And all of these can have a tremendous impact on your overall performance. With classic machine learning, you would basically do a grid search. You would basically say, here's my hyperparameter one, here's my hyperparameter two, let me try a bunch of different values and you know, do a grid search. But the problem is that one iteration of that takes a very long time and you know you you basically might not have that as much of an impact an alternative is to do a random search through the parameter space find the ones that perform the best and then do a grid search within those in particular you could also uniformly sample at random or tune the uniformity to uh, uh, scale that's log or to places where you know, the parameters actually make the most uh, meaning. And uh, there's a very nice analogy of uh, you know, the panda training, which is you basically, uh, like a panda mom, you invest years of your life bringing up one baby and 
you know, you have one model and you're tuning it to be, you know, by investing all of your energy on that one. Or the caviar approach, which is you spawn lots of models and each has a different set of hyperparameters and then you learn on, uh, on those. Um, the, there's a huge uh, importance in sort of choosing your training set and your dev set and your test set. And there's uh, a lot of challenges and um, uh, trade-offs in uh, how well you perform on your training set versus your test set versus your dev set. And we're gonna talk uh, a lot more about those uh, next time. So uh, to wrap up, I want to um, maybe dive back into, uh, I guess what we talked about today, which is um, the, the key key features of convolutional neural networks and how basically what I, what I really want you guys to do is not focus so much on the logistics and, oh, that's how it's always been done. And that's how I'm going to do it too. And I just have to learn about all of those different aspects of convolutional neural networks. What I want you to focus on is the, the fundamental principles behind each of these aspects. And that's what I tried to, uh, to emphasize throughout. Basically, we talked about convolutions and uh, you know, why they're important and you know, the, the spatial structure, the locality, the sharing of parameters. We talked about the fact that we're learning representations, that those filters extract features. We talked about the fact that we are learning those representations and we're tuning those to the specific learning task at hand. These representation learning is driven by the classification task that we have. We talked about these detection, yes or no, presence or absence, and these non-linearities. And we talked about the pooling layers that basically create these positional invariants and about the final layer of classification, how to deal with edges, with padding, and how to, uh, and you know, practical issues such as strides. And extremely importantly, how do we make our training invariant to small perturbations by basically creating the small perturbations and throwing them at our learning model as well, and then putting it all together for uh, different types of um, architectures for how to combine all of those primitives. And that's what I really want you to take home, the fact that it's an extremely versatile technique and you can use it in uh, many, many different settings. And then we're gonna have many opportunities through the class to talk more about the art of uh, training your models. All right, so uh, last question, who feels that they've learned something today? So. Lovely, thanks again for the amazing presence on the chat. This is so, so wonderful to see everybody asking questions. And again, all of these will be available through um, Panoptio. And I hope you guys have uh, tried this out. Um, so we have 71, 24, 303, awesome. All right, well, thank you guys. And then uh, we will see you on Thursday. Uh, thanks everyone, bye-bye.